All right, let's let's go live. Can we go live? I think we should go live. Let's do it. Yep. That's good. All right. All right, everyone. So um, for anyone who is um, tuning in to this community conversation, don't tell anyone. I promise I wouldn't say anything, Lisa and Jal, but um, this is my first LinkedIn Live host. So I wanted to try out a new platform, wanted to also reach some of y'all out there that we may have not heard from our other community Twitter spaces we've been doing um, with the Agile TD community. Today's topic, y'all, is going to be all about a survival guide for solo testers. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be a solo tester to come get inspired today. Um, and before I introduce our incredible two guests, I just want to remind everyone that we're holding this space for each of you. So if you want to, you know, ask any questions, raise your hand, and we'll get to them in the order that we can. Um, we do have a few pre-submitted questions from you all as well that we want to make sure we get to. But without further ado, I want to introduce two leaders that I just absolutely am obsessed with. Um, first off, you all know her, but for those that don't, I've been living under a rock. I want to introduce Lisa Hook, who is um, just an incredible leader. I've been following your blog for so long and love getting to meet you at Agile Testing Days USA last year in person. Um, they have an incredible career. They're a senior expert quality engineer at Ada Health. Um, previously, they've held, you know, principal Agile Tester roles at Flex Mobility Tech, um, and before that, Agile Tester and Scrum Master. So they've had a whole wealth of experiences, um, and I'm really, really excited to have you here today, Lisey. Um, and you have a counterpart here as well, which is why I was really excited about you two in this topic. Yes. Um, we also have Jao Pronta. Yeah. Um, who's a quality engineer um, at Ada Health as well. So this is going to be really interesting and dynamic. And previously, he was a principal quality engineer at OutSystems for quite some time. And I want to hold a space for this later in our conversation, friend, because um, I really, I think a lot of our people are going to be inspired by both of you and how long you both have held these leadership roles and continue to navigate up. But before I go on to a few pre-submitted questions, um, did I miss anything? I don't think so, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think so either. Um, thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, my goodness. Yes, absolute pleasure. Well, I have to say, um, I think that these types of audio only events, they are the interactive podcast that we need and deserve in 2023. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, before here, let's just dive in. There's a few questions. And again, anyone who's listening in, get comfortable, grab your favorite beverage. Maybe you're writing test cases you never had planned to. Maybe you are navigating a reorg right now. Maybe you're a solo tester who is, you know, in a one to 10 ratio with your development teams and you need backup. And guess what? It's not coming and management's adding another two developers. Maybe you're feeling alone regardless. This is a space for y'all to come get inspired with our amazing guests. Um, and, you know, for you both here, too, you both have worked with a ton of different leaders across the board. I'm wondering for you, as solo testers that you've interacted with, too, juggling multiple priorities, it's really easy to overpromise and underdeliver. I'm wondering what advice do you have for those solo testers out there? And how do you kind of know your limits? Um, and I'm going to start with Lisey. Yeah, I think that is a really um, great question because it does feel very, really familiar to me at least. Um, so I think what really helps me when there's so much to do and you don't even know where to start and every minute basically more requests coming in, what really helps me personally is to write things down and then to really have a look at that and give your best knowledge at that moment in time, uh, evaluate what's right now the most important, most valuable thing you can do. Everything else can and has to wait. So but I don't stop there just having my own like sort of pre-prioritization. I'm also voicing my intention, uh, including my reasoning to, for example, the team I'm working in or anyone else. So if there's any veto, anyone, anyone has uh, other information that might maybe change its priorities, they can and they will speak up. So I try to keep that very, very clear for everyone what I'm currently focusing on and why, and also what might uh, have changed since I've uh, last stated that, um, because it really helps me to to stay focused on one thing instead of just having like 20 
things open in my head. And I do realize also that this is not only for me the situation. I have a lot of teammates who regularly face that same situation as well. Uh, like my, especially my uh, engineer teammates, they do struggle and juggle a lot as well. So I think living good um, practices can can help us all because I'm not always at my best either. And sometimes I need that example from someone else. So that is sort of the in-moment uh, advice that I have, or at least the advice that I use myself. But on the long run, well, there's only one way out, enabling the whole team. No, I agree. And you've written about that in a few of your blogs. And we'll be sure to post that after this recording. But any of y'all, if you, if you Google Lisi, you can easily find her. She's written some incredible blogs about her own challenges in leadership. I want to go back to that, though, too. And then I want you to chime in, Joe. But I want to go back to that part, you talk about priorities, and we know that if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. We also know from agile principles, the need to shift. What advice do you have for those, you know, people coming up in their career and helping make their work a little bit more visible so others can see those priorities offline and kind of know where you're going, right? Because you're balancing a lot as a solo tester and, you know, everyone's coming at you at one time, but how do you keep everyone focused and show where all your priorities are so people can easily access them offline? Or do you? Well, um, I guess that, that there are, there, there's, probably, there's probably different layers mm -hmm. when answering that. Um, building a little bit upon what Lizzie was saying, I found myself um, throughout my career um, when having to, you know, juggle different priorities. I've seen myself having to speak with my manager or even my manager's managers, whoever, whoever needs to know uh, and needs to decide together with me. Um, having these conversations with them uh, about uh, hey, here are the things that are incoming. Um, this is what I think um, I can do for the next foreseeable, I don't know, month or sprint or quarter. I've had a lot of these discussions around quarterly kind of goals and objectives. And if you, if you sh usually if you're working with well-intended people and if you already own your own backlog, let's say, you know what, what things are incoming, you know what value you get out of those, um, and you kind of like rank them, uh, then those conversations become easier and people can understand a little bit better that there's only as much as you can do. You can't, you know, go after everything. But one thing that I also find is important is that um, sometimes it's not as much about talking about the activities that we are doing, but rather the impact and outcome that we are looking for with those activities. And when we're talking about being testers um, inside a team, of course, historically, I've worked a lot in teams that try to do whole team, whole team approach to testing. So I was an enabler, like he, uh, Lizzie was hinting. Um, and in those situations, I think it's very important, especially for people outside of the team and even going broader than just the domain of you and your manager, um, to um, understand why we are doing certain activities. Why are we investing? In automation, why we are doing these exploratory testing sessions, right? You know, um, and even from a business perspective, understanding the the sort of risks that we are avoiding, or which sort of let's say efficiency goals we are aiming at, that's really important. I hope this answers what you're looking for, Kristen. Oh, a hundred percent. I think that's something you know. I really wanted to hold the space. I've had a lot of people right now, you know, and they're struggling, and they have you know, lost a few teammates due to reorgs or, you know, this solo tester phenomenon that's been going on for a while now. So I think that's super helpful. I'm curious, though, what advice would you both give right now to those people out there in the quality space that are doing more with less? They've been working to consistently prove, right, the results and, um, and impact. But, um, you know, budgets coming up, people are getting cut. Um, are there are there any kind of quick wins that you could advise, you know, those up and coming leaders right now to make sure that they're, you know, showing the impact on the business? Is there like a quick win or anything that you would both advise? I think that's a, yeah, that's a great question indeed, because it seems to follow us around, right? Uh, or at least it's not the first time I hear this question. I, I think 
it's a common recurring question in the community, especially as we not always are treated as like first class citizens in that task and quality role, uh, also as other fellow teammates like designers or user research people and so on. So I think it's a recurring topic uh, to sort of being in the position to prove our, our worth. Um, I personally was lucky so far or very fortunate that I didn't have to go into that uh, specifically with like, I don't know, showcasing, uh, okay, this is the figure if you have me, this is the figure if you don't. Um, I do realize other folks have been in that or are in that situation though. So it's not, I, I think context here is really, really crucial. Uh, I, I personally just got lucky that I could always, or it seems from feedback, that people saw value quickly enough so that they even don't didn't raise that question. Mm, and we're going to unpack that a little bit more level in this conversation because I feel like one of the number one reasons why I wanted you both here is you both have this uh, ability to influence, not just across your teams, but across product and your development teams and leadership. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the influence frameworks here. But I think the one piece of advice for anyone who's listening is, don't be the heaviest piece of furniture in the room on moving day. <laughs> Stick to your values, yeah. but don't be the heaviest piece of furniture in the room on moving day, okay? Um, I think that's really, really important. Some of the best advice I ever got. But I want to go back to you too. We're talking about, you know, quick wins to prove the value. I understand it's a tough time for a lot of people. I'm curious whether in your own experience and or with any friends and colleagues, um, have you seen anything work well? Um, in terms of proving the value and the impact of things. Mm -hmm. For quality, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I, I can give a number of examples. Some of them are even really recent. And as I was saying before, um, like, uh, let's take one example I can give you. And this actually happened. So, um, a while back, I was working on a big automation suite. So, I put together, like, a lot of test automation and from, a, let's say, a more direct perspective, the people that were around me, they really understood um, the, the value that they were getting out of it. Because before they had to check certain things in a, in a, in a scripted manual way that now they didn't do anymore, um, or maybe tasks that they weren't even doing now, they're doing them on a regular basis, basis because they have automation. This is just one example. But then to explain even outside of that group of people um, what the impact was, um, I tried to put a number on top of it. And these things, sometimes they, they, they may seem a bit hard because, oh, I don't have any metrics. I don't have any data. But I just started asking questions to, for instance, my team leader. I was like, hey, uh, how much time did we spend beforehand in testing stuff or running these manual test scripts or whatever that we had? And they're like, I, I don't know. I, I don't have that data with me. Okay, but you have an informed opinion she had to estimate how much was that. And they're like, yeah, I think that usually per each ticket, um, we, you know, development ticket, we used to spend uh, around, I don't know, I'm making up a number, three or four hours worth of manual testing, something like that. And then I just, you know, I just used estimates and I explained in my reasoning that these were just estimates, but then it's like, okay, all of a sudden we have this automation suite, we have information about how many development activities and tickets were covered by the, this automation suite, and we can estimate how much we, um, how much we, uh, let's say, how much, how many hours of manual scripted testing we avoided because we now have the automation suite, and that's a different way of presenting things. And so I started saying, the outcome of of, of what we built here was that uh, in the last quarter we saved I don't know, 200 hours of uh, people's time in doing manual based. A repetitive task and that has that has an immediate uh, anyone can clearly understand what that means even if they have little context over whatever your team is doing so this is just one example where sometimes i think that we can get a little bit creative about showing the impact of the things that we do yeah, i think that's a great uh, example um i would as we speak of, of quick wins um 
and I said before, I, I luckily never got in a situation where I had to put a figure on, I don't know, my value or something. But what I generally do that I see avoids the question in, in the first place mm -hmm. is um, to really aim for making whatever you do valuable for people that they can really experience the benefit of what you're doing, like quite instantly before yeah. even that, that question comes up, right? So, I mean, yep. sometimes you have to go with those figures. Um, but if people realize, oh, wait, uh, having that person around or that activity being done or whatever it is you add, mm -hmm. um, help sure. us further, make more informed decisions, maybe uh, change even the reputation of a team or a company or a product, that something mm -hmm. tangible right away can really keep that question away from you, let's say like that. So I, I would always aim for high collaboration, fast feedback and, and aiming for what's actually valuable for the other person. I'm just having a thought here. Do you think that it's times we kind of like miss certain narratives and certain stories around things? Because another thing that I, 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 I think a lot about is like, um, we're testers and we do a lot of testing and sometimes we we're doing testing, but we're not entirely sure what, what we're testing for, or we, or even if we know, we can't really express that really well. That's why I'm, I'm a really big fan of, you know, understanding why you are doing these things. And usually when it's about testing, um, it's good to know about the risks that we're trying to cover and what made us concerned with something that may led us to a testing activity. Um, does that make sense for you, DC? Oh, it does. It does. And that also gives you further arguments, right? Because then you can exactly point and refer to that risk and uh, have different kind of conversations with different kind of people coming from different perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. I and I um y'all are taking us to software quality church and I'm here for this leadership. Um I do want to go back though to something that you said earlier, uh Lisa and Joe as well, is you talked a little bit about reputation, right? And so mm -hmm. I'm thinking a little bit about solo testers right now, but also I'm thinking about software quality teams. What do you do or what advice do you have for any of our listeners who may have joined a team where there wasn't the best reputation of the software quality team, you know, from the organization and it's partly you feel like it's partly your responsibility i mean it is a spoiler alert to kind of build up some of that reputation back and trust is there any advice that you all could give to anyone around how to kind of start to build back trust up in your organization as a software quality champion whether you're a solo tester or and or a leader well personally um you don't mind me going first right please <laughs> So I think that I have my initial reaction to that is that I don't think it's it's the kind of situation where, where there will be a recipe that that fits every single situation. Mm -hmm. OK, and I've and I've been in situations where uh, there was a lack of reputation towards quality uh, folks or a quality team, whatever you would like to call it, whichever way the organization is, is um, set up um, in all of those situations, I kind of felt that um, there was there were usually different reasons behind why the mistrust was at place. Mm. Um, it could be there were misconceptions about the, uh, the way quality should work, or uh, maybe um, uh, the product is suffering, the software product that you're talking about is suffering from quality problems that stem from the fact that we don't invest in quality, but then it's, it's kind of like it, it, it becomes the blame game where developers are pointing their finger at the quality engineers or the testers and the other way around as well. Um, and usually you need to start asking questions um, that kind of like allow you to understand the context and why that is happening. And it, it's really about a, a, a you know, uh, a sort of a, a five wise situation where you're really trying to get to the, to the core reasons of things. One thing that I've done um, when this sort of thing happens within a team, mm. one thing that I've done in the past that has worked really well is usually I kind of like try to get, get a, let's say, a, a quality um, assessment of the team in the sense of I want to know what everyone's thinking. And I've done this a few times throughout my career where I set up basically one-on-ones, short one-on-ones with everyone in the team 
it can either be maybe there's a, a, one or two more testers in the team or I'm the only one and I'm talking to also to all of the developers and the team lead, whoever is a part of the team. And then I start, I have a, let's say a three or four question interview where I go about things like uh, what hurts you the most quality wise inside the team? What are you, what do you believe the tester should be doing that they are not doing? What do you believe that the tester has been doing well? You know, these kinds of things basically to get the view from each person, um, about what's happening quality wise within the team. Um, and then I basically look at the patterns of what people are saying. Mm -hmm. Usually myself and even other folks from a quality background will be very surprised about some of the feedback. Um, but also it will be easier to understand exactly what, where those concerns are coming from. And then you can kind of like look at the strategic and the tactic where the strategic is where do I want to go quality wise to make uh, uh, lives better for everyone. But then at the same time, tactically, maybe there are a few things that I can do for these folks so that they can uh, firsthand understand that I'm trying to help them. Like they expressed to me, they gave me the feedback and I'm addressing that feedback directly. I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. Before I go over to Lisa, I want to go back to one additional question, Your Honor, because <laughs> I love this. Um, you're talking about those one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, meetings. I'm curious if you do any kind of Likert scale, one to four, or any kind of, you know, quantitative measurements um, when you're doing this kind of, you know, information gathering uh, around expectations. Absolutely no. I love that. I don't know why, but I always went out for the... Uh... Let's talk. Sometimes some questions pop up that I want to, to ask mm -hmm. uh, once the initial questions have been asked because I, I, I under, uh, um, I, I mean, I, um, what do you say? Um, I, uh, I figure out something that I wasn't expecting and there are other questions I'd like to understand. I do kind of like, let's say, um, gather a lot of notes around the interviews themselves mm -hmm. uh, with qualitative data so that then I can try, you know, after a while, maybe I'm looking at two, eight, nine, or 10 interviews according mm -hmm. to the size of the team. And I'm looking at, at that content and I'm looking at the patterns, not, not exactly looking for to put numbers on things, but looking at the patterns of, you know, topics that people bring up, uh, or that a lot of people brought up. I, the, the, the last time I did this, I actually, in the end, I had a, a an Excel spreadsheet, but it was more about saying stuff like, um, you know, uh, testers are not doing enough automation, let's say. And then I would say in the team of 10 people, six people brought that up. Or uh, I don't understand what testers are actually doing. In the team of 10 people, eight people brought that up. And then I start, you know, quantifying things in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is a great point. Uh, I also am always starting with observations and, and looking for these kind of patterns or also outliers. So uh, totally plus one on what uh, Raul uh, just said, um, because yeah, more often than not, we might enter a team or a pro or inherit a product that might not have the best reputation. So I really think that a lot of people might relate. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I'm I'm also currently in a situation where I started in a team uh, over one and a half years ago now, but still I started exactly at that point yeah. part of my talk by the way is also going to be about this um and how you can also change that narrative around Ooh, we're going to get into that for sure um i do though i do though lisa i want to come back to you though um if you're okay with it um and, and you know talk, talk uh time in two this is all about survival right <laughs> to help people start thriving you've done the you've done the information gathering right you've had some of the interviews how do you effectively bring that information back to the team and report? I've seen everything from, um, you know, people kind of branding their information gathering. Um, one of my mm -hmm. one of my friends, um, she does a what's the bug tour, and then she reports back after. Another person does do some measurement. They kind of do what we, you know, like an MPS score, if you will, before um, they mm -hmm. do the information gathering. And then after the quarter, they'll do another, you know, MPS score. Other people I've seen take keywords out um, and, you know, do like word clouds along with measurements. But I'm curious for you all, what are some effective strategies that you've seen to kind of bring that information back and present it to the team? Not just about this is what you've, it, more so focusing on the feedback, not what we're going to do, but more so what you've heard. 
Well, actually, the last time after gathering the feedback, and I, uh, um, I think I did this like a year ago or so. I, I thought that the best way to transmit the information was to uh, um, um, an infographic, you know, like a, um, you know, a visual representation where I had like these were the five most important themes, and I explained exactly what the teams were mm -hmm. and. Um, how prevalent they have been. Like 60% of you told me that this was an important thing, or 80% of, of, of you said that this was a concern. That was the way we're, in which I presented the feedback. And then I kind of like uh, tried to be as transparent as possible in the sense of, nevertheless, if you want to look at the details of what went on, here's a full on document for you to read. Maybe I'm not sharing the interviews themselves with you because there were those were made in private in a one-on-one -on -one setting, but there's, let's say, more detailed info for you to check. Check that out if you want to. Mm, I appreciate that. Lisa, anything you would add to that? Um, just that um, you can also not share. <laughs> <laughs> say more, say more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so what I did in my last situation, as, I, as I've shared, I've, I've been in that again was to gather those patterns and just use that for myself as my input to decide what's the immediate quick win for this team, what's the most valuable thing right now, maybe in my first month, um, and to rather focus my energy on that and, again, actually trying to instantly um, provide value and, and have impact where I can. Um, because sometimes people also share stuff that I wouldn't in like I would not literally um, share forward, but there's there's a there's an underlying reason why um, people come from different certain perspectives or how if they behave in certain ways. They, people always have reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's I think in from the situation, for example, I encountered here, it would have rather hurt the team to share like everything. Mm -hmm. um, back but instead i decided in that case to to only align with that with one trusted person to have to still have a sounding board just for me also mm -hmm. someone who knew the team um but rather focus on on getting my hands uh on like hands dirty and wet basically and contribute hands on as, as quickly as possible and, and show the team hey uh i, I can take some of the load I'm there, we can build relationships and rather focus on, on the trust and safety part first. I think that's so important. And I think that's you reminding me of one of my customers from years ago. And he was a solo tester. He had 12 developers. And I was always so impressed by him, you know, and I one time I asked him and I was like, how do you do all of this? And he was like, well, Tristan, um, what's left of my hair is full of secrets, but they're mine to carry, <laughs> you know, because the teams will oftentimes go at each other too. And so sometimes it can be really alienating as a solo tester or anyone in software quality who has to mitigate some of these conflicts. Um, I am curious though, for you all too, because in the spirit of thriving, um, I was trying to make a segue with referencing the reputation era of Taylor Swift and it really didn't pan out in my head, but imagine if it did. Um, but thinking a little bit more around, you know, influence frameworks, this is something that I've seen. It's the common thread that I've seen for so many successful software quality champions from solo to in teams, building an influence framework that works for you. Um, I had another customer years ago and I love, she talked about for her, it was around trust, flexibility, and visibility. And that's how she was able to, you know, not just survive, but thrive. I'm curious for you all, maybe earlier out in your career, how did you go about building an influence framework or just strategies to influence quality across your teams? Um. I think that the, the word trust there is really, really important, as you just said. Um, and, and I was even thinking, um, even, you know, bridging a little bit to what Lizzie was saying before, she totally has a point in the sense of, um, you know, in, in that previous situation, once you get feedback, um, the way, uh, the, the feedback that you're going to get can be uh, any of a number of things. 
And so um, sometimes the feedback that you get is that, uh, you know, people are not really getting along and that's the kind of thing that you don't want to um, all of a sudden put together in a, in a, in a visual, in an infograph and report back. So you hold that, uh, that back. And what I, what I, what I want to get at with this is that um, when it comes to influencing, I think that sometimes understanding what ticks within a team um, uh, um, is, is, is really important. I, I, in the past, I, I had a, a, a talk that I presented at Agile Testing Days where I spoke that I've seen different teams that have kind of like have different souls. You know, they have different dynamics, social dynamics within them. I've seen situations where, you know, the social dynamics led me to believe that there was a central figure that basically influenced everyone else and that that figure had, carries a lot of weight within the team. Mm -hmm. And so you, when you want to influence the team, you need to kind of like um, strategize around that. Sometimes the team is a bit more democratic, but you cannot win a team, a team over all of a sudden. And so you start small. So you, you, you pick the first person or the first couple of people that you that you believe that align better with what you're thinking or that are more willing to talk to you in an open way and you establish trust. And then this kind of like, it, it, it tends to become, let's say, uh, contagious, you know, and then you can start growing into more people and more people. So having, recognizing the, the, the proper allies while you're building trust in a larger group, that's really important. I don't know if you agree or not. Mm, kind of like Game of Thrones, but like, Happy Meal edition? Is that right, Lisa? With, with, with less, with less backstabbing, you know? <laughs> well, it's early, y'all. It's early. Uh, I love that, though. Lisa? Yeah, I, I would totally agree and, and add on what Ro just said. Finding allies, seeing, like, people people come first, right? Without people, I mean, all, all we do is together with people for other people. So people are at the foundation for everything we can and achieve together. So meeting them where they are and, and finding those people who might be more open for certain topics, uh, which might be different people for different topics, um, anything, right? To, to see where are the sweet spots, how, how are the dynamics, just what, what uh, Raul just said. This is definitely something that I also built a lot of my, my work on um, and how I could also then establish trust and, and foster those relationships that we have. Um, on a more foundational uh, level, what really helped me realize a lot of those things that I do, or or put a put a put some words on it, basically, mm. um, are two quite foundational concepts I came across. Uh, one is a, a model on power and influence. Uh, it's coming from Ren French and Raven. It's called Power Basis. Mm. It's actually quite old, and of course, it's a model and it's flawed but it really helped me think of the different ways how you can influence and, and use the powers that you have, no matter in which position you are. So that's definitely something that I encourage people to check out and, and build their own mental model basically on top. And the other one is, um, is coming from, uh, well, also system thinking, of course, but impact over intention is a big one for me as well. That helps me nowadays learn every day how to do better and uh, yeah, not not only having like having the best intentions is is great because I, I do really appreciate if someone doesn't try to manipulate me to do evil things that or things that I consider evil. But if you're not considering the impact of your actions, uh, you might end up way in a way different place uh, than than you thought. And that uh, starts with me. So uh, whatever I do when coming into teams or even welcoming new team members or just staying on the same team, but people change. Um, and, and always keeping in mind what kind of impact I might have. And if I mess up, and I probably will, um, to then also try to to learn and, and do better next time. So these two um, things really help me to yeah continue learning because that's what we all do. We're still on a journey. Can we, and this is really powerful, I'll make sure you have some time to chime in here, Joe, but I, I want to I hold a space for this, though, because, you know, not to not to make this too topical, but there is a certain CEO right now um, out in the world who's getting a lot of, you know, flack on social media for having taken, what is it, 6.4 million in bonuses? 
but didn't give anyone else, you know, bonuses. And then the recording leaked and everyone's making fun of her on social media. I swear this has a point. <laughs> but, um, you know, she is getting all of this criticism on social. And, you know, I think everyone should be held accountable. But on the flip side, I didn't see the same... Um, noise and chaos in social media when there were so many male identifying CEOs doing the exact same thing. So going back to your part here, Lisi, around impact and intent, I'm curious for you if you've ever felt that, you know, as a woman identifying leader, that maybe your intent, the reception, the impact um, was a little bit different than some of your other colleagues. And if so, what advice would you give to any of our, our listeners right now that, you know, don't come from um, some of those other, you know, backgrounds? I don't know. I'm, just, I'm thinking a little bit more around how women identifying and, you know, less represented leaders, how they're treated a little bit differently in this field and in life in general. So um, I think this is a deep question. Yes. Because... I and I also I'm trying to be mindful how to respond because I am very aware that yeah. I have a lot of privilege. Mm -hmm. Yes, I might be woman identifying, absolutely. That's true. So I'm not part of the like the mm -hmm. let's say the top people, the dominant voice, let's say, mm -hmm. not the majority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I'm still very, very, very privileged. So I I'm trying to learn continuously how how I have impact but also how people like Im impact can be really really different on people based on the privilege they have and also in different areas um personally I I did perceive of course different um different how do you say behavior towards me mm -hmm. um uh also the more I learn the more you see um and the more you cannot also uh, like not here or not see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, and uh, but I I still got very fortunate in my career because I had a lot of amazing sponsors, mm. and those sponsors, guess what? They were white. They were male, middle aged, mm -hmm. uh, in powerful positions as well, mm. and uh, they really advocated for me. And hence, I got the opportunities that I received. And I really want to stress that because. Yes, of course, I put in the work as well, but a lot of people do and nothing happens, right? Mm -hmm. I'm only at the position where I am or got or reached the, the roles or seniority levels or what, however you want to call them is because I had that sponsorship and that continuously throughout my career. Mm -hmm. And I think the mere fact, because I'm really, really privileged, right? Mm -hmm. But I still am only here because of that. And I think that is something I can definitely share. Mm, I love that. Um, that's super powerful. Um, I want to go over to you, Josh. Is there anything that you would add to that too? Um, maybe around, you know, experiences you've seen or, you know, ways to be better allies. I just, I want to make sure that too, we're not just, when we're thinking about, you know, solo testers and influence frameworks, we're taking at it from a, you know, cross-cultural intersectional viewpoint, because not everyone is going to have the same experiences, obviously. Um, any thoughts, friend? Um, yeah, I definitely see this. And I think that, um, um, of course, that I I will be on the group of the overrepresented. Mm -hmm. um, and in my in the past, the things that I observed is that, um, and the situations where I felt that I should act was first, as Lizzie just hinted, um, amplifying the voices of um the, the the underrepresented you know it's like you should hear what this person is saying uh basically trying to lend the privilege and but also acknowledging the privilege because the thing that i found was hardest to do was that sometimes um you know i think that um discrimination was at hand if people didn't even realize it not even the people suffering it you know it, it, it becomes so ingrained um, into our everyday lives and, and, and the dynamics within an organization that then, you know, no one's asking like, 
do you think this person is being treated like this because they're they're a woman or because they're from an underrepresented uh, uh, ethnic minority or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's really hard to, to deal with that. But I'm always, always trying to be mindful of the fact that I have that privilege. And, and you know, the I guess the best thing that I can do is to put that privilege uh, to working towards others, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. I I had another so many customer stories, but I had another customer, and I I just I'm I I still to this day I, I just obsess over this leader, but you know for her she was <clears throat> a very queer, um, you know, um, just amazing amazing Latina from um, Brazil, and she was that solo tester, and I I kept on asking her because she like came into her org by herself, you know, they had no QA teams. She was all by herself, had 12 developers. And I was just so impressed by her. And I said, how do you, how are you this fabulous and effective? And she said, Tristan, I just have me <laughs> literally and figuratively <laughs> on this team. So I'm going to be my authentic self. Obviously, I might have to switch a little bit in how I communicate between different levels of leadership, but I'm not going to change who I am. Um, and I think that that's been one of the most effective ways that I've been able to impact quality as a solo tester. And so I know it can be hard for some people out there, um, whether you're worrying about your jobs, your teams, but authenticity will go a long way for influence too. Um, don't forget your values and don't forget yourself um, in your own happy meal edition of Game of Thrones. Um, but I do want to kind of shift a little bit here because we are talking about survival and I want to make sure to talk a little bit about your upcoming talks. This hour is flying by. I love you all. And everyone who's listening, I hope some of this was inspiring for you. Um, if not, don't fire me because it's free. Um, but <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we talk a lot about shifting left in our testing, but I'm thinking a lot about us testers, whether we're a solo tester or, you know, a leader, and we're really trying to get there earlier in the feature development and design process. Like, um, I've heard everything strategies around ambushing, you know, your product leaders, which can be a little challenging when we're working remotely, but I'm curious for you all, what advice would you give to those leaders out there that are trying to be a part earlier in the design process and bringing testing along the way? Lacey? I sort of hoped y'all would go first. Well, either or <laughs> y'all, this is your time. I'm just a stage mom here today, everyone. Yeah, I was hoping that Lizzie went first as well. You can do a start and then hand over to you. Oh, I love that. Okay. Um, so I do think, so I'm, I'm approaching this from the angle of fast feedback and providing value early, right? Mm. So what would be helpful at that moment in time when we come up with ideas, maybe we test it out, uh, maybe we come up with designs. And usually questions, regarding aspects that really matter to us mm -hmm. um, can help um, like help us think in directions early on without investing too much um, time and effort and, and, and people people's nerves basically, right? Mm -hmm. So asking good questions in a timely manner is definitely a, a gold mine, let's say, but how do you do that, right? So I usually just learned how what kind of questions might do the trick by asking a lot of them, and many of those weren't those good questions, but maybe one of that was, and that might be a game changer. So I, I really would like to encourage people not to be afraid of asking questions, uh, even if out of 10, you know, nine are like, you know, maybe quickly answered or already taken care of or whatnot, is a really good chance that you have a question that nobody else dared to ask, especially early. Mm. You can of course ask those later as well, but the earlier, the more valuable they are. So, Joao. <laughs> I, I, I would add that, um, and, and to, to ask the questions, you kind of like first need to just to get your foot in the door in some way, you know? Um, sometimes if, if, if there's a problem, if there's already a problem with you being involved in earlier discussions around projects and whatnot, um, you, it, usually 
you, you could ask like, hey, this I, I noticed that this thing is happening. Can I be in that meeting? And a lot of and maybe people will say, oh no no, we'll we'll involve testers later on mm -hmm. or something like that. We want to keep the you know the a limited number of people inside of the meeting and whatnot. But then other ways of getting your foot in the door sometimes is like, hey, can I read a little bit more about uh, this topic? And usually that if if they open that door, which is a door that's easier to open, I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, and they all of a sudden they present you with the document. Usually it will be in a format where you can place comments that people will see. And those will be good places for you to, you know, make comments or where you ask these questions that Lisa is talking about. But also even maybe going a little bit further and proposing something like, hey, I'm thinking that there's a lot of risk with what we're talking about here. So how about if I facilitate a session where we do X, Y, and Z, or some, maybe we should do a risk storming or, you, you know, kind of like trying to set your own stage so that you all of a sudden have a seat at the table. I don't know if this makes sense to you folks or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can appreciate that. Well, Lisa, you're going to say something before I chime in. Lisa? Yeah, I, it does totally make sense. And I was also thinking about um, in the direction of risk storming. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, because part of that is to sit together and figure out what is actually important, right? What what matters to us? Mm -hmm. So we can then focus on these areas, yeah. but we have early alignment as well, because we already talked about this at an early stage. Um, well, you can also do that, of course, for an existing product or feature, or like you can use that method for a lot of things, but just the mere conversation, what matters, and then asking questions around what matters. Is, is doing a big part of the work. Mm. I appreciate that. I want to make sure, though, um, we're thinking a little bit more. There's been a lot of conversations <laughs> in this in this hour, um, but I do want to make sure we hold a little bit of space, too, because you both have been super, super busy, not just in your organizations, but also spreading the gospel, aka the good work. And I'm curious if you all could just tell us a little bit about... Um, Y'all are going to be in person coming up with Agile Testing Days. And I'm wondering if you could just maybe um, in a few sentences tell everyone um, what they can expect at your upcoming talk. Sure. Um, I will go first. Um, if he doesn't mind. So I will be at Agile Testing Days USA um, end of May talking about uh, my, the name of my talk will be a little less testing and a little more quality. Um, it's not; it won't be a, a talk about how testing uh, is not valuable. On <laughs> definitely not that, but um, it will be. It's a talk about all of the different ways in which you can influence quality that aren't exactly testing as we think about it in the classical sense. This that we were just. Like talking, this thing we were just talking about right now is will be one of the examples. Is like being able to ask questions earlier on, so that then you don't end up doing testing later on for stuff that you should have asked questions at the beginning. Um, but there are other examples, and the the idea around the talk is um, not just you know throwing it out uh, in theory, but also in practice, where I will tell a, little, a, a few real life stories that happened to me and what and what I did to influence quality that have nothing to do with testing. Mm, mm, I love that. I love that. Um, Lisi, a little preview of your upcoming talk. It'll be, y'all, it's going to be end of May. We'll drop the information here as well. I'd be a terrible state to moment if I didn't share this information with you all. Uh, but Lisi, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm also going to be at ATD USA. I am already really looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to have a talk in a workshop and actually they're quite related uh, to what we talked about here. So the talk is going to be all about team transformation tactics. Mm -hmm. So basically influence, how can you influence team culture? How can you turn this around if you, you know, maybe encounter a culture or reputation that isn't, you know, less than desirable? Uh, what kind of things can you try uh, or at least what helped me in my past, because of course I can only share from my own experience and hope that there's something you, you know, you can take away and try yourself. Yeah. So um, things that you can try to get the whole team moving towards shared ownership, towards 
a holistic testing and quality approach with all the different aspects and facets. And yeah, so it might also not be um, very, um, well, let's see what you think. You can tell me afterwards. But as Joao also just indicated, it might not be like the classic testing and quality things uh, and topics that you might think of, but um, these will be the things that help me transform teams towards better and basically prepare, um, prepare the foundations so that we can then focus on all the easier aspects of, <laughs> of developing mm. high quality products. Um, yeah, so that's going to be my talk. Um, the workshop that I'm going to give is all about technical confidence, which is also part of like personal growth that I'd love to share further with, um, with people. Um, so to how can you grow your technical confidence and, and gain um, not only more technical skills in general, because we all can do that, but rather allow yourself and, and give yourself the freedom to to focus on the learning part and the, and enjoy that part as well in that journey. So yeah, that's uh, that's going to be my sessions. I love this, and I have to say, y'all, um, I went to my first at all testing days USA <clears throat> last year, and it was just cool to kind of like. I know we're all talking on social media, but it's kind of cool just to break down the walls and actually see people in person. You learn a lot about some of your favorite testing heroes. I'll leave it there. I love y'all. Um, but I want to say too, shout out to the Agile Testing Days USA team. They have, you know, really wanted to step up during this uncertain economic global climate. And they're offering a ton of discounts to meet everyone where they're at um, for continuous learning. Um, they have special pricing for those of you that may have been affected by a reorg or layoffs. They have a young professional program. They've got team discounts with free hotel rooms. It's true. I know. They also have those discounts for y'all that are self-employed, um, and they also have some for nonprofit organizations too. So you want to go ahead and check it out, agiletestingdays.us slash register. We'll share this information as well. Um, there's still time for early bird. They have the one-day tutorial, or you can come to the two-day conference, or both. Um, but I want to say as well, it really was one of the best software testing conferences I've ever been to. Um, so I'm really excited to go back this year and, you know, for y'all that aren't able to make it, um, you know, in the U S there's additional opportunities, um, coming out in the EU. Um, and we're also going to have some more of these free community conversations with some of your favorite leaders. So, um, I want to say, stay tuned for that, but I'm going to stop spamming, um, marketing spamming, who knows? Um, I do though want to go back to my favorite part of these questions. Um, Lisa, this isn't in the script, but, um, are you ready for some rapid fire questions? Well, you, you know, yeah. let that let, okay, let's go. I promise this will be easy. So, Lisi, what's the number one song right now that you can't get out of your head and why? Oh, uh, I don't really listen to music, more to audiobooks, so nothing. <laughs> Wow. Okay. See, we're learning, y'all. We're learning. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. Michelle, do you also just listen to audiobooks? This is fascinating, by the way. No, no. I love music. And the number one song that I have right now in my head is Wet Dream by Wet Life. Ooh, I'm going to make a note of that. I love that. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, this is good. Um, Lisi, what's the what's the book on your bookshelf right now? I'm on your nightstand or bookshelf. Oh. What are you reading right now? Well, that that is an easy one so i'm currently reading the broken earth uh, trilogy i'm in the first one and i'm really loving it so i love that i love that job same question so the book that is that's in my bookshelf i i told you i really like music so it's basically the latest anthology by bottle from u2 but it's a bit of a boring book so i haven't picked it up that, that often. yeah <laughs> Bono, he just can't get a break these days. I feel like it's the Apple, you know, uh, Apple curse there. I'll say less. Um, I, I appreciate, um, what's the best, <laughs> sorry, too soon. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received in your career, Lisi? Oh, that's a tricky one. First one that comes to mind. Well, I'm an introvert. I need time to think, so I have maybe Ralph. Yeah. <laughs> you. I also have to think. Mm. Biggest piece of yeah. advice, the best piece of advice I ever got in my career. Well, you can also give me the best worst piece of advice. 
Oh. <laughs> Um, I, I have a hard time to remember any advice, honestly. I de I'm definitely, I definitely received advice. I'm pretty sure of that. But I'm blushing out now. I hope your coaches aren't listening. <laughs> well, the worst, I guess that the worst piece of advice was when I was starting, um, when I became a, a conference speaker, yeah. uh, my first conference speaking gig was at Age All Testing Days. Mm -hmm. um, I, at some point, I was considering switching orgs, but one of the things is that the, the new company wouldn't give me as much as freedom for me to be a speaker in different conferences. And someone told me, you know, you can just, you know, just do internal talks at that company. It will be the same thing. That was the worst piece of advice I've ever gotten from anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not the well, same thing. Well, on speaking, actually, also had a well meant but not working for me advice <laughs> and i was um to just use bullet points or keywords and nothing written out for talks and you know just formulate everything freely well that works brilliantly for other people i'm not that type of person so i, I learned the hard way i had to to find really the approach that works for me mm. I can appreciate that. I think that's a really good point here too, as we wrap is like, you know, one of the things I often tell people or anyone who listen is sometimes when you want to build influence, sometimes you can build, and I was talking to, you know, a, a developer, you know, I used to work with you years ago and she, um, she really felt like she had been working there for so long and she wasn't being appreciated and, you know, it didn't, wasn't visible in the organization. Every time a deal went through, you know, sales was appreciated, blah, blah, blah. But she's like, what about us developers that have been, you know, attached in QA that have been attached to these projects? We don't always remember the corporate ID, but we were there and that project helped close and renew. And, you know, I told her sometimes you can create internal visibility via external output. So maybe you're speaking at a webinar, maybe you're coming to, you know, a meetup, or maybe you're at a conference, maybe you published a blog, or maybe you're, you know, doing the short form on social media, whatever it is that you need to do to sometimes build internal influence. Also, think about out external too, right? Because you have to protect your brand too. You only have one. Um, so I think that's super important. I want to say, lastly, any closing words of inspiration to all of those solo testers out there right now and or anyone who just kind of feels alone in their quality world, Joe? Yeah, so I think, um, and I'm a person who once was in a situation where I, I did quality assurance for five years, and at the end of that, I said, I will never do this again in my life, so help me God. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started doing a, a whole bunch of different things. And then eventually, after a long while, I was convinced to come back into the quality space because I had the skills. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that changed for me was um, leveraging the community. You know, it's just like I just started following people on Twitter. I started showing up to a few events. I became friends with people like Lizzie, for instance. <laughs> Um, and, um, and that basically made me fall in love with, with this whole space and this whole area. So if there's any place where, um, you, you can bet, you can get your solace, you can get your source of, uh, of, uh, your, you know, of strength, mm. uh, it can be the testing community. Mm. I love that. Lisa, closing words, thoughts, concerns. Yeah. Yeah, this one was came easier to me because what I instantly have in my head is something I remind myself about all the time, and that is that we are not alone. Yes, we might be the only one having that dedicated role, um, but we are still not alone in our struggles, and we're not alone in this journey. We are, well, usually, or at least, well, maybe that's not the case even for you, but at least in my experience, I was always part of a team and a team that I could also uh, foster and, and, and uh, rely on in that, maybe not from the start, but over time. So we can build that culture that we are also not feeling alone. And if you really feel alone all the time, maybe maybe it's time for a change then. Because in my situations, that was the one thing that helped the most overcoming those struggles together and also realizing that I'm not the only one who struggles. 
um, if we join forces, we can move a lot forward together. Mm. I still want to brand this. I love that. I still want to brand this the Happy Meal edition of Game of Thrones. But, you know, we'll see what happens there. Um, I want to say thank you both so much for spending a little time with us and just, you know, helping inspire us. I know so many people are going through a lot of challenges right now. And so this space was just everything. And I'm so excited to see you both in person in Chicago. Um, and for anyone who can't make it, tune in, follow Agile TD for more of these community conversations. And go get inspired and plan your own talk. There's plenty of, you know, upcoming speaking opportunities for you as well. With that said... We are going to round it out the hour. Everyone have a blessed evening, or if you're out here on the Pacific coast, um, a good morning to you. Um, appreciate you all so, so, so much. And stay tuned for more of these events. Ciao. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.